<laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, good afternoon. In a short while, we will be joined by our friend Carl Scow, the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the World Food Program. He's here to brief you on his recent visit to Haiti and answer any other questions you may have. Uh, also on Haiti, uh, I can tell you that we welcome the official installation of the Transitional Presidential Council that took place in Port-au-Prince today. We call on the new authorities and all stakeholders to expedite the full implementation of the transitional governance arrangements. We've taken note of Ariel Henry's letter dated yesterday in which he res is resigning as prime minister, as well as the publication in the official Gazette announcing that uh, Finance Minister Michel Patrick Boisvert is now the interim Prime Minister. The Secretary General reiterates his call for the swift deployment of the multinational security support mission to Haiti to support the Haitian National Police in addressing the dire security situation. Uh, the Secretary General appeals to all member states to ensure the multinational security support mission receives the financial and logistical support it needs to succeed. This morning, Gare Pedersen, uh, the Secretary General Special Envoy for Syria, briefed Security Council members while addressing other vital issues. Mr. Pedersen underscored that renewing the Constitutional Committee is essential, and he remains open to any alternative venues to Geneva that attracts the consensus of both the Syrian parties and the host. Meanwhile, Mr. Pedersen continues to appeal for, uh, excuse me, appeal for sessions to resume in Geneva as a bridging option. For his part, Ramesh Rajasingham, the Director of Operations at OCHA, uh, sorry, the Director of Coordination Division at OCHA, told council members that humanitarian needs in Syria are already at record level. He added that the cross-border operations from Turkey continues to enable vital aid to enter northwest Syria, adding that we are currently engaging with the government of Syria for the use of the Bab al-Salam and al rai crossings beyond May 13th, which would make a big difference in the lives of so many people who are in need of humanitarian assistance. And just to flag that later today at 3 p.m., the High Commissioner for Human Rights, our friend Mr. Volker Turk, uh, will brief the General Assembly on the implementation of the GA resolution that establishes the independent institution on missing persons in Syria. The mandate of the institution is to clarify the fate and whereabouts of all missing persons in Syria and in relation to that to support all victims, including survivors and family members. The High Commissioner's uh, statement will be available to you under embargo about an hour before his, brief, his briefing gets underway. Uh, moving to Gaza, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs OCHA, uh, our colleagues at OCHA, and our humanitarian partners are working on health care in Gaza, report that as of yesterday, only 54% of patients requiring medical evacuation had their requests approved by Israeli authorities. That's fewer than 5,300 patients out of the more than 9,800 in total that need evacuation for medical reasons. Meanwhile, the overwhelming number of conflict-related injuries in Gaza has strained evacuation resources, with injuries being prioritized over chronic illness, such as kidney failure and heart disease. Humanitarian partners report that in some cases, children in urgent need of kidney dialysis have died while awaiting evacuation permission. Our colleagues from UNHWA uh, warn that the risk of disease is spreading high in Gaza with alarming rates of diarrhea and hepatitis. And in Rafa, there are about 1.5 million people are displaced or living. Trash is building up between makeshift shelters, heightening the sanitation and hygiene crisis. UNHWA says that access to fresh water is also very limited, posing a growing threat to public health, particularly as temperatures in Gaza are starting to rise. Sigrid Kag, our humanitarian, uh, senior humanitarian and reconstruction coordinator for Gaza, briefed the council yesterday evening on the situation in Gaza and said that a paradigm shift is needed to continue to meet the immense needs of the civilian population in a safe and in a secure manner. The paradigm shift, she said, requires a further scale up of the quality and quantity of assistance and distribution irreversible steps to enable safe, secure, and unhindered aid delivery in Gaza, and planning and timely preparations for early recovery and reconstructions. She told the Council that operationalizing the UN 
2720 mechanism for Gaza will start in the coming days. The mechanism, she said, will initially be applicable to Cyprus, the Cyprus and Jordan routes respectively. Technical consultations are being uh, taken for Egypt. Uh, and you saw her also yesterday at, um, at the stakeout. Moving to the African continent, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, more than 20 years after their arrival in the country, the peacekeepers from Pakistan are now preparing to leave the country. The contingent constituted the bulk of peacekeepers deployed in the South Kivu province. Their departure is part of the UN peacekeeping mission's disengagement plan from the country, initiated at the beginning of this year. Since 2003, when they were first deployed, more than 100,000 peacekeepers from Pakistan have served in South Kivu, including 31 Pakistani soldiers who died in the line of duty in the service of the United Nations and the people of the Congo. Today, our colleagues held a ceremony to recognize their important contribution to peace and security. <coughs> As we mentioned, according to the disengagement plan in parallel with the UN withdrawal of UN, uh, the parallel in parallel with the withdrawal of UN troops, the Congolese government will increase its presence in the area. The mission is vacating at the government's request. And staying in the region and going to Sudan, in a joint statement released today, the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Joyce Masuya, and the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflicts, Pramila Patton, appealed for more international engagement to combat sexual violence against women and girls in Sudan. Their appeal comes as allegations of rape, uh, forced marriage, sexual slavery, and the trafficking of women and girls continue to be recorded, especially in Khartoum, as well as Darfur and Kordofan. And as the Security Council will resume its meeting tomorrow afternoon on conflict-related sexual violence, Ms. Misuya and Ms. Patton are urging members to send an unequivocal message, which is that under international humanitarian law, civilians in Sudan, and as a matter of fact, anywhere around the world, must be protected and must never be subject of acts of sexual violence, which could constitute war crimes. Um, Turning to Ukraine, uh, the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us that several civilians were injured while homes and railways and infrastructure sustained damage in attacks on the town of Smila in the Cherkasy region, which is in the center of Ukraine. Aid workers are on site providing emergency response, including support to repair windows and damaged homes. Meanwhile, our humanitarian colleagues warned that intensified hostilities have slowed down the delivery of aid to frontline towns in Chasiv Yar and in the Chasno Rivka uh, area in the Donetsk region, uh, where several thousand civilians continue to live amidst ongoing hostilities and disrupted access to critical services. Uh, and our colleagues in Paris at the UN uh, Organization for Education, Science and Culture, otherwise known as UNESCO, launched a report today on how social media affects girls' well-being, learning, and career choices. The report warns that while digital technologies can enhance teaching and learning, they also present risks such as invasion of users' privacy, distraction from learning, and cyberbullying. It also sheds light on how social media amplifies gender stereotypes with negative effects on girls' well-being, learning, and career choices. More online and related today to uh, related to that. Today is the International Girls in ICT Day. In a post on his Twitter account, the Secretary General called to equip uh, and support more girls in information and communications technology, pointing out that fewer women than men have access to the internet and that stands in, way, in their way of getting equal opportunity for work. Uh, today is also World Malaria Day. This year's theme is accelerating the fight against malaria for a more equitable world. 94% of all malaria cases and 95% of deaths are in the World Health Organization's Africa region, and that's data since 2022. There is another international day today, which you can all go celebrate in the delegates' lounge. And you know what day that is? <laughs> I'm gonna, I was going to say something, but it would get me in trouble with a certain member state that you come from. Um, <laughs> No, today is International Delegates Day. Just a reminder that without delegates uh, and their lounge who negotiate agreements and coordinate with their home countries, the United Nations would not be what it is. Uh, I don't know. <laughs>
I'll stop before I lose my job. Edie. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. Um, is Sigrid Cog leading um, the UN negotiations on the UN involvement in building the US peer? There are, she's involved in it. A number of other entities uh, are involved in it. I mean, as you know, different UN organizations have a different uh, mandates, but I think she was pretty clear on her involvement uh, yesterday when she spoke to you and to the council. And a second question. Um, Human Rights Watch is reporting that the armed forces in Burkina Faso have massacred over 200 civilians in a village raid. Does the United Nations have any confirmation of this or any uh, comment? We, I, I do not have any confirmation from at this point here. I can tell you that the, these reports are extremely, extremely disturbing, and we will be looking into them. Mr. Lynch. There it is. Hi, Steph. Um, can I? Can you give me a sense of whether the UN agencies have reached agreement with um, the Israelis and the Americans on whether they will distribute from the pier where the pier is going to be? I gather it's in southern Gaza instead of the north. Um, will they operate out of a kind of Israeli IDF security perimeter? All those dis all those discussions are ongoing. Uh, as we've said uh, repeatedly, for us, there are a number of, uh, of principles that we need to observe, uh, of humanitarian principles, notably on our, on our independence, on our freedom to, uh, to deliver aid to those uh, who need it without any interference. So all these things, I mean, bo both in terms of policy and logistics are currently being discussed. Michelle and then um, Vladimir. Just to follow up to that, um, how much of this is to do with the, the security arrangements that the US might have with the IDF on securing the pier and then how the UN interacts with that? Well, let, let's, let's be honest, when you're operating a humanitarian uh, operation in a combat zone, uh, security is pretty high on the list. Uh, Vladimir and then Kristen. <clears throat> Thank you. I have two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, my question concerns yesterday's uh, Russian veto of the draft resolution calling on all countries not to deploy nuclear arms in space. The US ambassador suggested that Russia was hiding something and it was shameful. What is the Secretary General's position on this issue? I mean, well, I mean, the vote is the vote, right? And the Security Council votes. Those members that have the power of the veto sometimes use that veto. Um, we stand, so I have no particular comment on what happened in the council yesterday, but of course this, the United Nations stands against uh, the nuclearization of outer space. <clears throat> Another question. The European Parliament adopted a resolution on Russia's uh, undemocratic presidential elections and their illegitimate extension to the occupied territories. The resolution urges the member state of the EU and the international community not to recognize the outcome of the Russian presidential elections and um, uh, to limit uh, relations with Putin to humanitarian and human rights purposes. Will the Secretary General take into account the position of democratic countries on the so-called Russian well, I mean, the, the Secretary General has always, anywhere in the world, called for free and fair election. That being said, uh, we remain uh, in, in contact and have uh, uh, relations with all 193 member states of this organization. Madame. <clears throat> Thank you, Seth. Uh, the Palestinian civil defense had a press conference earlier on those mass graves mm -hmm. uh, at the hospitals in Gaza and said that they found many that looked like they were buried alive, um, medical tubes in them. Uh, uh, the question is, what should they do with that information? They say they need a forensic examination. Mm -hmm. 
where should they go for this? What well, would you? What would the UN advise them I, to do? I think do? It, it is important. All the <coughs> excuse me, these circumstances uh, to ensure that any potential evidence is uh, kept in a way uh, that is not compromised. We've called for an international investigation. How that will take place, it's unclear at this time. There's certain parts of this organization that have the authority uh, to do that. Um, Which parts of the organization do you think could be of help? Well, I mean, there's there, certainly there, uh, investigations can be. Uh, 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 those vary, right? There, there are legislative bodies of this organization that could create and call for an international investigation. That has yet to happen. Uh, in the meantime, it's important that all forensic evidence uh, be well preserved. What about the special rapporteur on extrajudicial summary they're, they're and arbitrary not, they're, executions? They're not investigatory. Uh, they don't have investigatory authority. Deji, and then we'll go to the screen, and we'll come back for round two. Well, uh, first, a hypothetical question. It's not a hypothetical question, anyway. Um, we know that we know that there's there's this plan to to start the ground offensive in Rafah city uh, uh, from from IDF, but it's kept you know postponing, and but they said they didn't cut it off. Um, how how much improvement does the UN has to prepare for humanitarian Im response to that? Yeah, like like because you got more more time to prepare. is a military operation, a ground operation in Rafah, given for the, the more than 1.5 million people that are displaced there and have no place uh, to go. One can, can easily imagine uh, the humanitarian catastrophe that this would be. Um, we're well aware of what is being uh, talked about uh, in the news. Um, we make the contingency plans that we're able to make, but let's remember, as I, I think, as I told Michelle a few minutes ago, we're we're operating in a conflict zone, right, uh, in which we have no, uh, we don't have the full control of or uh, of the aid that can come in uh, to Gaza. Uh, what I can tell you is that we will not be a party to any forced displacement of people, but. As we know, s the summer is coming. Um, in that part, I mean, in Gaza Strip, uh, the temperature would increase quite dramatically in the summer. Um, how much worry does the Secretary General feel about the living conditions for those displaced people? Displaced I mean, the, the living there? conditions are already atrocious. But I mean, it will as, be as we mentioned, the, gar the garbage, the garbage is probably the, 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 you know, the whole system of treatment of solid waste uh, has basically crumbled uh, with the, uh, the, 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 the unimaginable uh, sanitation impact that that has on people's health. Michelle, oh sorry, uh, then Ibtissam, so just go ahead. Um, just on Haiti, um, can you share with us the list of which countries so far have notified um, of their involvement? Uh, or plan to be involved in the security I, mission? I can, not and off the top much? of my head. Okay. I will and let you much? know. I don't think the needle has moved on the cash in the account. And how much cash is in the account? It was 10.6, I think. Okay. Well, I will, let me let me not think and let me check. Okay, thank you. Ibtissam, and then we'll go to Alan on screen. Um, I want to follow, on, uh, follow up on uh, uh, Kristen's question regarding the forensic, evi forensic evidence. Uh, you said that they should preserve any forensic evidence, etc. But we know, as a matter of fact, that people there are overwhelmed, mm -hmm. whether doctors or any yeah. teams, etc. Shouldn't the UN be then proactive uh, and send teams to help them do that, uh, yeah, giving the, 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 the situation on the ground? I mean, it's not a matter of... of the Secretary General be proactive because we do not have a mandate to participate in such an investigation uh, at this time. Uh, the other thing is, as you well know, that for any investigation to actually be uh, uh, effective, 
uh, investigators, wherever they come from, would need to have access to in Gaza, which would require uh, the permission of a number of countries, including Israel. But okay. uh, if, if I may push back a little bit on that, because, I mean, you don't have to have a, to start, I mean, isn't it, if I'm, and if I'm not wrong, it's part of your mandate also, or at least parts of the UN, to collect uh, information and evidence on what's happening on the ground. It's like, you don't have to be also... No, I, we, we are, we are, I mean, I, I, let's not get too much into the weeds here. Uh, we're collecting information taking custody of, of potential evidence is a different issue. Uh, let's go to Alan, and then we'll go to our guest. <clears throat> Hello, Stefan. Do you hear me well? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question, please. Um, a court in Ukraine arrested the abbot of the Svetogorsk Lavra of the canonical Ukrainian Orthodox Church. His name is Arseny, Metropolitan Arseny. So he's, he's arrested, and uh, uh, I have a question. Given the uh, well-known track record of the Ukrainian oppressions against Orthodox priests, does the ESG have any, have any uh, opinion on the freedom of religion in Ukraine? Thank well, you. Well, we firmly believe in the freedom of a religion. Let me look into this case and see what I can get for you, Alan. <laughs> Thank All right, you. I'm going to go get Carl. Please be patient.